Oh, yeah. Florida and Tennessee facing off this week, two days from now, in Gainesville, Florida. I cannot even express the importance of this game for both of these teams and their seasons to come. So let's waste no more time. Get right into today's video because there is a lot to talk about for both teams. Now cue that intro. Oi fellow comrades, it's Squid Tart here and welcome to my preview and prediction video for the Florida Gators and the Tennessee Volunteers facing off this Saturday. Uh, make sure you sub up to Squid Tar if you have not already. I've got the Florida Hate video coming tomorrow. Of course, originally, as in uh, last year, I used to combine the Hate video and the preview video, just kind of do them in one little batch, but I'm doing it a little differently this year. I make the preview video where I don't do much trash talk, if any, and all of the trash talk, of course, will be tomorrow, Friday. You'll know right by the thumbnail exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, so let's roll into the Florida and the Tennessee game. So, uh, of course, yearly rivalry, a big matchup. I don't know if that will take place, um, you know, every single year with the new SEC adjustments coming uh, years from now. But nonetheless, uh, this is a huge game for both teams here. Uh, giving you some basic knowledge about this rivalry, Florida right now leads the series 31-21, to and since 2000, Florida has won 18 of the last 23 matchups. So I'm not necessarily trying to cherry-pick uh, results or anything here, but Florida has owned the series since 2000, and, well, they own the series all time. But Tennessee does have the winning streak over Florida. They won last year in Knoxville 38-33, to and uh, it's going to be interesting this year seeing how, you know, the progressions of all these teams have come. The last time Tennessee beat Florida in Gainesville was 2003. And I talked about uh, since 2000, only two of those matchups of the, of the five that Tennessee won, they won uh, on the road in Gainesville, Florida. So that tells you about the success of Florida in this rivalry against Tennessee. Now, most of that is credit to due to incompetence on uh, the Tennessee coaching staff. Uh, throughout the past decade, but nonetheless, uh, Florida and Tennessee has been a very lopsided rivalry these past few decades. But now we're progressing into the new season. Of course, last year was a really fun and interesting game to see. Came, down, came pretty much down to the wire. Florida got the onside kick, nearly won the game right then and there, but Tennessee managed to hold on and win that game. So no matter uh, how good or bad each team is, this game always finds a way to be interesting. And now Tennessee's losing, uh, of course. They lost Hendon Hooker, uh, the player that, of course, beat Florida. But Florida is losing Anthony Richardson. Both, so both these teams are without the quarterbacks from last year. They've got two new quarterbacks coming in. Tennessee, not necessarily a new quarterback, just a quarterback who's now starting again after um, after Hendon Hooker took over in 2021. Joe Milton coming in for Tennessee, and then of course for Florida, Graham Mertz came uh, as a transfer from Wisconsin. Both these quarterbacks haven't necessarily had uh, bad, you know, they haven't really had bad reps uh, this season. Joe Milton, I'll, I'll give you the rundown on Tennessee before we do Florida. Tennessee, of course, undefeated right now, 2-0. They beat Virginia and Austin P. Uh, Joe Milton right now is 42 of 63. He has four touchdowns, 429 yards passing. 66.7 uh, completion percentage uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, you, you get the idea. And then 40 rushing yards to go along with that. So, you know, as Tennessee, as I mentioned in my last preview last week, Tennessee is a running-based offense, and they haven't gotten away from that. Uh, Jalen Wright and Jabari Small both have over 25 carries. And, uh, well, Jalen Wright is 233 yards rushing, Jabari Small with uh, 162 Dylan Sampson and the other running backs didn't really get much playing time uh, in the Austin P game. Right now, Dylan Sampson, I think he only got three carries. I think it was six. I could be wrong about that. Nonetheless, uh, didn't really do much in the Austin P game. But I think the I, I really do think the running backs did more than the wide receivers. Uh, in the Austin P game, there was definitely a big red flag that I saw with Tennessee, and that was the philosophy change on offense and there was quite a big change Tennessee really you know they, they've always been known to be that kind of big threat 
that you know can run the ball down your throat and then when you least expect it take a deep shot down the field and find an open man well Tennessee really went away from that last game uh, and they haven't really shown that throughout anything uh, this season uh, I think only once or twice Joe Milton has taken a deep shot and if you look at what happened in the last game against Austin P. Uh, Tennessee only had two plays, and I love to you know troll about this, uh, but this was kind of the truth. They either ran it up the middle with Small or Wright, or they took a Joe Milton and threw a screen pass behind the line of scrimmage, and that was it. There wasn't any type of throws, slant routes, curl routes, uh, deep throws. None of that was there. It was practically non-existent. I think only one or two passes that Joe Milton threw in the Austin P game came from uh, over the line of scrimmage. So definite red flag there. I'm not sure why they made that change. There must have been something wrong. Uh, but there was something wrong. Um, I think the issue, though, was that Joe Milton kind of threw the ball a little too hard. In the Austin P game, he went for 228 yards passing and 7 yards rushing. So he didn't really run the ball at all, never really took advantage of the dual threat that he has there was a lot of missing pieces to what should be a really really good offense so a lot of confusion going into this Florida game hopefully we rebound off of that or maybe we're just hiding our offense I don't know uh, Ramel Keaton and Brew McCoy were the only wide receivers who had more than 50 yards passing in that game and if there was a shocker uh, from the Austin P game that had to be our backup tight end McAllen Castles who had a really good game uh, against Austin P. He had a touchdown, a big touchdown, and quite a few receptions. So shout out to him. He may be he may be the guy that's kind of that shocking player this season. I think a lot of people are going to keep their eyes on him. I've heard comparisons with that him. You know, Castles is like the next Brock Bowers or something like that. And I hope they're right. I, I legitimately do. But w w let's let's back up on that comparison at least for now. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, but yeah. A lot of big news coming, of course. We're expecting a big change in the offense because what we did against Austin P that probably won't work against a team like Florida, and it definitely won't work as we progress through SEC ball. Cooper Mays, our center, will be back for this game. He was out for the Austin P game. He chose to sat out, and the coaches were okay with it because uh, he needed to be 100% heading into this game. Well, he should be back for this matchup. Keenan Peely, haven't heard any news on him. I think he's going to be out for this one as well. Unfortunate loss. Hopefully he will be okay. Now, in terms of the defense, I'll tell you this much. Uh, we have a one-man wrecking crew on the defensive side of the ball. Aaron Beasley had a phenomenal performance against um, Austin P. And that was partly, to, partly due to some really, really great play calling by Tim Banks. You know, you, you saw it at the very, very end, right before the quarterback snapped the ball. Aaron Beasley would go in motion. He'd move from where he is in the backfield and move upwards, torching right through the offensive line and hitting the quarterback straight on. He forced a few fumbles. Just a great overall game by uh, Aaron Beasley. And if he's able to do that the same way he was able to do uh, all of that in the Austin P game, chances are Florida is in for a very, very tough time. Uh, in terms of the backfield, Kamel Haddon actually had an interception. The defensive backfield didn't really let Austin P do anything. It was a great performance overall. They let him have one uh, big play that resulted in a touchdown. But other than that, nothing too bad out of that game. We may, I highly doubt we'll see Nico get any playing time in this game. This game will probably be a lot clo too, too close to where we see the back of quarterback play. I think the only way... Nico gets some playing time in this game as if uh, Joe Milton uh, ends up getting hurt in the game. But we'll have to see how that goes. So will Tennessee open up the offense in this game? We have no idea. We'll have to figure that one out. As for Florida, let's go ahead and talk about them. So the Gators are 1-1. One one. They had the big win over McNeese. I mean, as in big win, they blew him out. And then the loss to Utah in week one. Utah was without Cam Rising, so that looked a little more embarrassing, especially with Utah a week later making the Utah-Baylor game as competitive as it was. Uh, Baylor, was it? Yeah, Utah and Baylor, uh, the, the same Baylor that ended up getting whooped by Texas State. So, you know, take from that what you will. But Graham Mertz uh, heading into this game, he was 45 of 61, 526 yards, 73.8% on completion. Uh, that's his completion percentage. Two touchdowns, 
and one interception. That's one more than Joe Milton has thrown in his entire career at Tennessee. Yeah, I'm letting, I'm letting you know about it right now. So one of the big things, one of the huge red flags if I'm Florida here is definitely when it comes to running the ball. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of it. Now, Montrell Johnson and Trevor Etienne, they're pretty good running backs. Each of them have over 100 yards rushing, and they're pretty good at it. Graham Mertz, though, um, there's a big concern. He's We haven't seen him run the ball at all. In fact, he has negative 21 rushing yards. That is how many rushing yards Graham Mertz has. So that is a definite big red flag if I'm Florida. Because if the quarterback's not able to run the ball, that takes a big part out of your offense, especially with Joe Milton, who is a dual threat and will be able to run the ball if he absolutely needs to. We saw that in the past few games that he played in. So, yeah, that's a big, big step back for Florida, uh, really, when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. However, they do have a really, really good wide receiver in Ricky Pearsall. Uh, he has well, o well over the amount of any other wide receiver on the team. 250, 215 reception yards and 14 receptions. So he's, I, I'll say it for sure, he's really good. I think he's going to be a huge problem for this Tennessee defense. I think he's going to put up some numbers on uh, Tennessee. As for everyone else, they have less than six receptions. So that should tell you that Mertz and the, the system that Florida has is heavily reliant on Ricky Pearsall. So he is a, going to be a huge part of that offense in this game. And I think he's going to play a big part in that game. I think I said that twice. Nonetheless, you get the idea. In terms of the defense, Shamar James probably the best player, at least this season, that we've seen on Florida. He's had 19 total tackles. Pretty good player. I think he's going to give the defensive line a bit of trouble. but um, uh, Or the offensive line, excuse me. Uh, Tennessee kind of struggled a bit on the offensive line these past few games, so hopefully we'll see that kind of recover, but we, who knows? Maybe we won't. We, we have no idea. Um, but but I, I did mention how Cooper Mays will probably be back in this game, so that will definitely help out the offensive line. They were missing him in the last game against Austin P. so enough of that, though. You get the idea. One of the other things that I noticed about Florida that I think will definitely be kind of the big talk of this game is the defense, and especially the backfield, um, the team has only two sacks total and has not forced an interception. So does that does that mean the Florida defense is bad? Does that mean the Florida defensive backfield ain't no good? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But it is alarming that you, you look at the stats that Florida has and find out that they only have two sacks and no interceptions. Now, were they playing pass-heavy uh, offenses? Not really, no. But... The, the, the point is still there. There was def there hasn't really been too great of a showing from the Florida defense. But who knows? Florida's defense can come out super fired up, uh, force Joe Milton to throw his first interception in Tennessee's career history. Um, you know, maybe they'll sack him a bunch of times. You don't know. What I will say, though, is that this matchup is always competitive. Both these teams are always... It, it's a lot like the LSU-Auburn rivalry to where no matter how good or bad the, the team is record-wise... They always come out and make it a competitive game, and that'll be the same thing here. I think this will be a really hard-fought game. Uh, both Tennessee and Florida, I think, will be fighting each other. It wouldn't even surprise me if this game was tied going into halftime. However, I think, whether it's the early in the third quarter or the fourth quarter, wherever it may be, I think the talent gap and I think that the offense that Tennessee runs, I think they'll start to open it up a bit. Maybe Joe Milton will throw a few deep passes on Florida, get, catch their defense off guard. I've mentioned that Florida secondary hasn't forced any interceptions. I think they'll need to in this scenario because otherwise I think Tennessee is going to make a couple of big plays here. The defense might get wear, worn out because Tennessee is going to be running the ball a lot. And you'll, you'll notice it by the fourth quarter because that's where Tennessee shines. Once the defense gets tired and exhausted from the tempo offense, uh, it's it's very well possible that Tennessee is going to start to pull away. So, when it comes to my final score prediction, I of course have to ride with the Vols. I say it's something along the lines of thirty-four to twenty. The Volunteers are going to beat Florida in the swamp. So who knows? Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think I'm right about that, and I know that a lot of Tennessee fans think I'm right about it. People are doubting us though, and I don't really much appreciate that. And it isn't like the Georgia fans to know, oh, they have us losing the game. They're doubting us. No. 
A lot of sports analysts are doubting Tennessee and thinking that they're going to roll into the swamp and lose this game simply because they haven't had much success in the series since 2000. Well, that doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you, you look at both teams, you figure out which one's more talented. Um, that's, that's all you need to know. But hi history does not matter. Or maybe it does. I don't know. What do I know? What do I know? I'm just some stupid Tennessee fan that's making a video in his room about how Florida sucks and they ain't no good and Tennessee's going to beat them. Well, you'll find that out tomorrow when I make my hate video. But anyway, that's my final score prediction, 34-20 to 20, Tennessee. Let me know down in the comments below what you think. And, of course, you can guess that I will see you all Saturday. So until the next time, I'll see you all later. And as always, Go Vols!